Hello and welcome back to Core Finance. I'm Matt Brown, joined by Sean Richards from Not A Yes Man Economics. And we're going to talk about uh, well, an article in the Daily Del Telegraph at the weekend and the balance of payments. So if you can just enlighten our viewers on, on the article and what that means, whether they got it right or wrong. Sure. The, this attracted, has attracted quite a lot of attention around social media, various other places. And in essence, um, the Daily Telegraph published an article saying two things. One is that the UK's net international investment position has got a lot worse, figure of 490 billion, um, and also that the flows have turned against us. So there were two bits to this, but the thing that had the major impact was a number like 490 billion. Huge number for 2016, I believe. Was yeah. yeah, and if we look into this, there was a bit of... Um, it's hard to cover this sort of thing in polite language, but there's also been the article comparing this with our GDP. Well, you're comparing a stock with a flow, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. It's a little bit awkward, but anyway, the other ones. That's a quarter of a year's economic output, I suppose. That's a measure of sorts. Once you start looking into that, though, um, and this is something I do, sort of pouring through the numbers, there are more holes than the Swiss cheese in it. Mm -hmm. In essence, the Office of National Statistics has very little idea of the flows in and out of the UK economy. Um, it has problems with the trade figures, which if you start with, would you think some of that would be at least relatively simple, cars going in and out and so on. Gets more difficult with things like um, services, how do you measure that? But it has a lot of problems with that. In fact, it's so bad that just under three years ago, it lost its national statistics status. So they had real problems there, there have been big areas, the numbers are then revised. So then if you take this forwards, to the stock of wealth number, then you open with a lot of caution, in my view, and you certainly can't start um, claiming that there flows of numbers like that, because you see, the truth is, they simply don't know. Mm -hmm. um, if we look at what they consider to have been the change, what they do is they benchmark the ownership of UK shares by foreign institutions, foreign people, and so on. You think, right. But then how does that work? Because if you read into it, they then say that their 2010 numbers, they're still revising in 2017, <laughs> yep. and now we're actually using the 2014 benchmark. Ah, so they don't know then. And so we here have an obvious problem of then you're assuming 490 billion, which is based on a number that they didn't know in 2014. It might be by some outrageous fluke right now, but there's no real basis for arguing that's right now. And if we go into the flows, it's something to my mind that's even worse because a lot of this relates around, it turns out, to interest on corporate bonds that people abroad get from the UK, mm -hmm. which apparently they got a lot more of in 2016. Well, how does that work? Because we all know yields are really low. So how do you get more out of this? Mm -hmm. If they come back with a reply to me on that point, I'll let you know. <laughs> and this is the problem with these sort of assumptions. And if we come back to the basis of the numbers, it would be absolutely fantastic if we knew the UK's net international investment position. So yes. we knew what we had abroad, what they had here. It would always be a movable fees because currencies are changing and that matters, but mm -hmm. if you had some sort of idea. But once you start looking into the assumptions and that, it's quite plain that we don't. And let me throw something else into the mix from uh, part of my career in the past. I've dealt with quite a few big investment funds that don't want anyone to know that they're investing. I dealt with Sat there was one particular instance. If they heard their name mentioned in the dealing room, they'd pull your line. Yes. They wanted complete secrecy. So how are we going to know what they're doing? They're hardly going to be writing it down for people to say. At a later date, some of these reports come through. But again, we're talking about stuff that's way out of date. Mm -hmm. So the truth is, for all the claim things of 490 billion, and this is spiral around, as I said before, so many media places, not true. Well, the biggest irony at the bottom of this is there was actually an improvement in these numbers, and it's quite a simple thing from simply the fact that the pound fell. Yes. So what we held abroad was worth more in pounds. So there was actually a gain to us there, which is completely forgotten in the 490 billion because that came out in the previous release. So my point is, for those that have read this or seen it or that, it is just simply... Untrue on both counts. Mm -hmm. Untrue on the scaremongering, because the article came that the uh, pound would collapse. It's going to be a good laugh Monday morning, because actually it went up in one of its sort of better starts mm -hmm. to the... Uh, I mean, also that the gilt market would collapse, and that actually by the end of the day it was up 
So that didn't work either. And the simple truth was that those that actually understand the position and hopefully are dealing with the big money flows realise that these numbers are pretty hopeless. But playing devil's advocate, let's assume for a second that the number is correct. It's 490 billion outflow from the UK 2016. What does that actually potentially mean for, for the UK? Did, we're talking 2016, we're now in the back end of 2017. Yeah, that, a, a lot, lot has changed since. If some were taking that forwards and it was an implication of the EU leave vote, mm -hmm. and then you would then sort of protecting that forward, anticipating that it might be a flat. Yeah. Then you have a basis for, if you like, a doomsday scenario, money pouring out of the economy in this thing. This is a thing that very rarely attracts much attention when you get out to the primary income account, secondary income account, where you calculate all this stuff at the back end of the balance of payments. And it's the bottom of the release. Very few people, apart from me, read that far. Most only read page one or two. But then if you come back to the trade figures, we're always running a deficit, then you've got a problem, because suddenly we've got deficits everywhere and it's all getting worse. This is the doomsday scenario. Yeah. And that's where people have sort of grabbed onto that on two grounds. One is, it appears that there's been a genuine issue with our trade for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Said earlier, the numbers have loads of weaknesses, that's true, but this situation's been true for 30 years. There's probably some truth in there. How much, we don't know. Mm -hmm. And then if we add the next bit onto it, as I was saying, there then would be a problem. Suddenly we don't have any assets abroad that we could argue we'd pay for it. Or to rephrase it, assets less than the liabilities mm -hmm. that others have here. Understood. Well, uh, key is to obviously do your homework, read the numbers, read the full story and um, not jump to any conclusions. Certainly the gilt market and sterling. Well, uh, definitely. And the, the real key wrong. point out of this is, I'm sorry to have to say that so much of even the official data is simply unreliable. Mm -hmm. People do their best, but it doesn't cover the full picture. Understood. Well, on that note, Sean, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you.